<laughs> what I have said, however, explains my description of the general purpose robot as a mirage, meaning an illusion of something that may be strongly desired. Now I must speak of the fundamental obstacles to developments on those lines. Every existing robot operates in an extremely restricted world, a sort of playpen. Uh, that limited set of objects which are to be processed by the robot's computer program is often referred to as the program's limited universe of discourse. Such a limited universe of discourse may be a so-called tabletop world where block stacking jobs and other eye-hand operations may be carried out or it may be a drawing book for visual recognition jobs in two dimensions or a board for chess or some other game or puzzle. Whether or not there are psychological motives for a, a choice of an extremely limited playpen universe within which the robot operates, there are certainly practical reasons. The whole of a very large computer is being, all, is being used to organize the sequence of operation of one of these robots. If the universe of discourse within which it operates were made a lot bigger, the size of computer acquired would increase astronomically. This is often referred to as the combinatorial explosion. The combinatorial explosion means an explosive increase in the computer power acquired to deal with moderate increases in the so-called knowledge base, which the computer has to keep organized. It's not the movements of the robot that require these huge computer powers, it's organizing the logical analysis needed to decide its sequence of operations. A so-called self-organizing program is a program that can organize the sequence of robot operations without clues fed in from the fruits of human intelligence. Experience indicates that any self-organizing program must continually cause long searches to be made through the computer's store of data regarding the universe of discourse. A typical search might be for that combination of items and their associated attributes which satisfies some relationship necessary in solving a problem of what to do next. The combinatorial explosion means that the length of search grows explosively with an increase in the universe of discourse. Essentially because that length of search depends on the number of ways in which items in the store of data can be grouped according to particular rules and that number of ways becomes enormously large, extremely fast. Doubling the universe of discourse may make the searches thousands of times longer. All this means that any big increase in computer power that will come in the future will allow these self-organizing programs to handle only a moderately increased size of universe of discourse. All attempts at general problem-solving programs, whether concerned with theorem proving or with the so-called common sense problems that arise in most robot situations, have been and must continue to be severely limited by the combinatorial explosion in the size of problem which they can tackle. Repeated failure to get round these difficulties led to programmers being forced to adopt an expedient known as the heuristic. This is a method of constantly guiding the search by, as it were, telling the robo when it is warm and when it's getting warmer and so on. A procedure that we all know shortens any search. The heuristic is a numerical measure of how warm the computer has got, that is, of how favorable to the aims of the program is the current configuration within the computer store. It is purely human intelligence and human experience that assigns this heuristic, this evaluation function. For example, a specialized program for playing chess involves such a heuristic based entirely on human knowledge and experience of how to evaluate a chess position. This numerical evaluation includes basic elements like an estimate of the advantage of any difference in the white and black forces with the usual weightings attached to the values of different pieces, like a knight having about three times the weight of a pawn, and attaches also suitable weights to space control elements, like the added, nup added up number of squares under attack from each of one's pieces with extra weight for any center squares, and uh, similar numerical estimates of the extent of development of one's pieces, the degree of exposure of one's king, 
and so on and so forth. Because of widespread interest in finding out how good a computer might be in a complicated game like chess, devoid of any chance element, a great deal of effort by chess grandmasters, including the former world champion Botvinnik, has been expended on getting these evaluation functions better and better. Then the computer conducts at each move a long search to find a sequence that will give it the best achievable position, three or four moves ahead, assuming that its opponent makes its best replies, where best, of course, means only best from the point of view of the evaluation function. This line of research was pursued actively for over 20 years, so the results give a good indication of what can be achieved with special purpose automation when a very large amount of human knowledge and experience about the problem domain or universe of discourse, still quite a modest one in size, has been incorporated into the program. The programs play quite good chess of experienced amateur standard, characteristic of county club players in England, although chess masters like our own David Levy beat them easily. This story is typical of the whole range of advanced automation in general, which has made reasonable progress when directed towards some specialized purpose concerning which a very large amount of human knowledge can be incorporated into the program. On the other hand, general purpose programs cannot be designed in this way and in any large variegated universe of discourse they fail by enormous margins owing to the combinatorial explosion. The general purpose robot then is a mirage. The science fiction writers, and possibly others, will try to keep it shimmering or appearing to shimmer there on the horizon in front of us, and there's something in most of our minds that wants to believe it's there. So many people may feel disappointed to hear it's not. Although, really, they should feel encouraged by evidence for the uniqueness of man, the uniqueness of the human race and of human brains. The many unique features of human beings include emotional drives and remarkable gifts for relating effectively with other human beings as well as powerful abilities for reasoning over an extraordinarily wide universe of discourse. There is no reason why any of these features should be realizable in a computer of relatively simple organization driven by even a very complicated program that has been read into its store. No reason why such a combination can begin to approach what the vastly more intricate networks of nerve cells inside human skulls can do. Neurobiological research on the visual cortex has shown the extraordinary efficiency with which specialized networks of specialized neurons play their part in an analyzing visual fields. It's probable that the extraordinary self-organizing capability of the cerebral cortex has resulted from the evolution of specialized neural networks of extreme complexity which there is no question of imitating with a programmed robot. Research on many different aspects of brain structure and function will continue and will increasingly be helped by computer-based theories adapted to the actual neurobiological data and problems and to the results of experimental psychology. At the same time, advanced automation in various specialized problem domains will forge ahead. However, the gap between these two fields will remain too great for the attempts at building a bridge between them to be effective. Always there may be some people who try to make us think we can see that old general purpose robot shimmering there on the horizon, but he's a mirage. Thank you very much, Sir James. I suspect that a number of people will be rather sad to hear that robots are a mirage. And we have here at least three people who have good reason to believe they're not. 
For instance, Professor Mickey runs a laboratory in Edinburgh, which is one of the world's leading centres for robot research. Donald Mickey, would you like to start the discussion off? I'm certainly not going to take you up, Sir James, on the term uh, mirage. And I think to do so might be presumptuous in this company. Uh, Professor Gregory is one of the world's leading authorities in optical illusions of all kinds. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and presumably that includes mirages. But I am going to take you up quite sharply on the term general purpose because I have the feeling that this is very near the crux of the matter. And I have a suspicion that under your term, general purpose, it's possible that there are two quite distinct and two quite important notions uh, snuggling under the same blanket. Uh, one notion being the notion of an experimental device, a research prototype, which one might more properly call a research purpose device, and I would be happy to talk about research purpose robots, by which one means devices which have no other purpose but, be, but to be used by scientists to advance knowledge in a particular new domain to test feasibility and to investigate principles. It's very close to the idea of the experimental prototype. I would say that the uh, primitive flying machine of the Wright brothers would be a good example of such a device, certainly general purpose. And certainly the work done with computer-controlled robots in the various artificial intelligence research laboratories around the world in the last five or six years, uh, I think could fairly be described in those terms, research purpose robots. The other concept which I think comes under the same uh, term of general purpose and may be confused with it is the notion of versatility by which one means the ability to reinstruct uh, re-educate almost a device rather quickly and rather easily and rather conveniently from the point of view of the human user and this property of versatility is of extreme interest to workers in the field of artificial intelligence and it's not entirely without relevance uh, in the future, perhaps in the industrial applications of robotics to assembly line operations and similar tasks. One of the problems in the industrial context is the problem of short runs, where a given product, product has its specifications changed every few weeks or every few months, uh, requiring radical uh, retooling and uh, writing off of assembly equipment and there's a good deal of interest at present in industry in, in how to incorporate versatility in such devices. Research on versatility in programming systems of a complex kind which have to deal with fragments of the real world is one of the studies which may lead towards that end quite apart from its own intrinsic interest.